Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Inspirational Interviews. I'm Hannah Levin with Heartfelt Wellbeing, and I have an awesome guest today who is going to give us some amazing advice just in time for holiday cooking. Natasha Ho is an amazing woman. I've enjoyed getting to know her a bit recently, and she is going to be sharing her tips on how to eat for your health without sacrificing flavor. So let me tell you a little bit about Natasha and then I'll bring her on. Natasha is a master trained chef and avid traveler who has studied culinary traditions from cuisines around the world. She is obsessed with making adventure and joy accessible through food. And boy, don't we need that these days. We can travel through our palates. <laughs> She teaches food lovers and home cooks how to master globally inspired flavors and flavor palettes, sharpen their skills in the kitchen, and learn to cook the most delicious meals. So I'm so excited to welcome to Inspirational Interviews, Natasha Ho. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, great to have you here. So I'd love to just start with you sharing a little bit about your story. How did you come to love food so much and enjoy teaching others how to make it enjoyable and yummy and healthy? Yeah. So, well, I my first experiences in the kitchen were as a kid. I had my mom and my grandmother, my grandfather. They were all amazing cooks. But I actually found being in the kitchen really intimidating because they were so good. So I did not want to be in the kitchen with them because I thought I was going to mess everything up. Um, and then when I went away to college is actually when I discovered my own enjoyment and love for cooking because I had to cook for myself. Nobody was around to cook for me. Yeah. And that sparked a real excitement around cooking and playing in the kitchen. And I think that's one of the things that was really fun is like, there's not a lot of opportunities for play in our lives, but mm -hmm. being in the kitchen, it's like you get to play, you get to experiment. And um, so I eventually I decided to go to culinary school at night while I was working a day job. And that introduced me to even more of a love and appreciation for food. And um, I was really intrigued by working more with international flavors, with the flavors of other cultures. So I took a bit of a sabbatical. I left my um, career and I went traveling for several months. And while I was traveling, I went to places like Spain and Turkey and Brazil. And I studied food while I was there in those countries. And so that really cemented my love of working with global flavors. And so um, over the years, I've been sharing that with people through um, casually like throwing dinner parties where I make all these dishes that I learn in other parts of the world but um, recently with COVID happening I, a lot of the people that I've been working with from a who wanted to travel more had didn't have the opportunity to do that this year so we've been traveling through our mm. and and I've been working with them to bring some amazing dishes from other cuisines into their homes. I think that's so fabulous what a wonderful focus for us to be able to just yeah, if we're stuck at home. Yeah. <laughs> like your, your mouth can still go on vacation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. So um so talk to us about so one of the one of the things that we had, had mentioned is people kind of get in ruts of cooking mm -hmm. the same things over and over again. So speaking of that ability to go on vacation through your mouth, <laughs> um, what what advice can you give us for people that feel stuck in a rut and want to switch things up, but kind of yeah. don't know where to go. Yeah, I think one of the things is it can seem really intimidating to have to learn a brand new recipe and learn uh, an entirely new cuisine. And it's like, okay, I have to go on the internet and spend hours searching for the perfect right. recipe. And then I have to hope that it turns out right because online recipes, they can be hit or miss, you know, right. it's actually going to come out very good. So I think the thing that helps is instead of trying to tackle an entirely new recipe is really to embrace flavor and working with some new flavors and applying those flavors to the things that you already love. So for instance, um, in my group Travel and Feast, we talked about Ethiopian food last week. And so we were talking about Berber um, spice mix. And so this is a mixture of a bunch of different seasonings like fenugreek and cardamom and pepper and all these other beautiful spices that go really well together. And so you could buy that pre made or make it at home, either one, but just using that seasoning, you can 
transform a bunch of different dishes that you already make. So if you're making steaks and you wanted to make them more Ethiopian inspired, you could make your steak and then make some brown butter. So just browning the butter in the pan, add the Berber seasoning to infuse those spices into the butter and then spoon that butter over your steak or chicken or whatever it is. And now you've transformed that dish into something completely different. So you're not in the rut of we just had pork chops or steak or we just had roasted vegetables. You can sprinkle the, that Berber seasoning all over your roasted vegetables and now it's something completely different than what you've had on a normal weeknight. And you didn't have to master a whole new dish. You just had to bring a new flavor into the mix. I love that idea. Yeah, and we, you and I had talked about um, understanding the six tastes, which we look at in Ayurveda, right? The balance of the six tastes. And I love that idea of just bringing in some different spices mm -hmm. to, to a meal or foods that you're already familiar with. Yeah. And that also broadens the six tastes that you can hit on in the, in the same, whatever, uh, spectrum of food yeah. that you're used to cooking. Yeah. I do it with my scrambled eggs. We have scrambled eggs like all the time at my yeah. house. Um, and scrambled eggs after a while, it's like, okay, we need something a little bit different. So it's like, oh, you know, I buy some kimchi and then I mix the kimchi in with my eggs. And now I have Korean inspired scrambled eggs. And then the next week it's like, I'm going to add some oregano and cumin and a little bit of chili powder. And now I have Mexican inspired. Mm. And it's like, I just kind of keep going with that. And so the eggs don't have to change. I've mastered scrambled eggs. Right. I just mix in these other flavors. Then I can have something that feels brand new and tastes exciting still. Yeah. So along the lines of seasonings that, that we're talking about, tell us how, how do we know which seasonings pair together? Yeah, I think the easiest thing is to really just lean into the tried and true combinations that other cultures have already experimented with and created and understand work really well together. So like I was mentioning with Mexican food, we know that cumin and oregano and chili powder work really well together because that's a combination that we see over and over again in Mexican food. If we're looking at um, like herbs and we look at the Mediterranean and they have things like lemon is mixed with uh, thyme or rosemary. And mm -hmm. so we can pull from those and that will help to take a little bit of the guesswork out of figuring out what to mix together when it comes to seasonings. And another key thing that um, helps a lot is just remembering the little phrase, if it grows together, it goes together. Mm. And so that works both from a seasonal perspective of if it grows at the same time of year and it's in season at the same time of year, then it's gonna go together really well. So the ingredients that are growing right now, like apples and pears and cranberries, those things work really beautifully together if you wanted to layer them on top of each other. And then we also will look at where in the world do those ingredients come from? If they come from the same region, it's very easy for for you to pair them together. So things like if we're looking again at the Mediterranean, we have like pomegranate and fig and lemon, those and thyme, those flavors mm -hmm. all pair really nicely together. Pistachio, all of those ingredients, they can layer on top of each other because they're from the same part of the world. They are able to um, combine easily without us having to do a lot of guesswork across like, is this something that's going to work with another ingredient? Mm. I love that. That ties in so nicely with this seasonal eating that I teach. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's beautiful. So what what would you make with fig and pomegranate, lemons, pistachio and... Oh man. Um, <laughs> like, would you make a compote or something? Yeah, with all those compote. I did um, recently, I did, um, I did for dessert, I did a creme brulee. And mm. with that, I mixed together the, um, I did pistachio, a little pistachio crush on top. I did turmeric actually was one of the flavors I also threw in there because it was just, uh, I had some on hand, but lemon, thyme and turmeric were what I mixed together. And then I did the pistachio crust on top of it. Um, and then and I think those would work really well if you were to do them as, a bit of a syrup on top of a chicken. So if you were to cook mm. down the fig and the pomegranate juice, those two, um, a dish I really love is Lebanese pomegranate chicken. Um, mm. And that one is you stew the meat down in the pomegranate um, juice or molasses. Mm. And then you sprinkle it with uh, pistachios at the end. Uh, or oh, walnuts. Wow. walnuts work really well for that too. So that sounds really good. <laughs> I can dig up a recipe and, and send that to you. <laughs> awesome. We can we can share that with the group. Yeah. Um, and speaking of which, hi, Betsy. Thanks for being on here. And if anybody has questions that you want to pose to Natasha while we have her here live, feel free to type them in. Um, I'm going to keep going in the meantime. 
talk to us about how we can get ourselves or people that we live with to eat more vegetables. Yes, this is a question that comes up a lot because I meet a lot of, mm, I don't want to call them vegetable haters, maybe vegetable non-lovers, <laughs> <laughs> lovers in, in, in progress. So um, I have this too with, you know, trying to get little ones also um, interested in eating vegetables. And one of the things that is often um, a obstacle to getting people to eat vegetables is because vegetables have bitterness. They have a bitter flavor to them. And a part of that is because it's their protection. Like they, they don't want wild animals like other wildlife and humans to eat them mm -hmm. so they have bitterness as a protective mechanism um, but at, over time us humans have decided that we like a little bit of that bitterness and we're willing to use eat it in order to survive but with little kids they are especially sensitive to bitter elements because bitterness in the wild will usually tell us that something is poisonous and so we would know to avoid that ingredient because of the the bitterness um so what we can do is try to downplay the amount of bitterness that shows up in vegetables and accentuate some of the other flavors that are there especially sweetness or savoriness are things that our palate really enjoys so if we can accentuate the sweetness and the savoriness and help to put the bitterness a little bit uh to lower the volume of the bitterness in that vegetable that can help a lot and so some of the two tricks that i use the most in order to um, make vegetables more palatable for anybody who doesn't like them is first roasting vegetables mm -hmm. it's very very simple but with the process of roasting it will bring out a lot more flavor in that vegetable and it's through the caramelization browning mired reaction they're all the same thing but it's basically when you raise the temperature to a high enough point, you transform the molecules inside of that vegetable and we bring out sweet molecules, we bring out savoriness, we bring out nutty flavors, we bring out a whole bunch more flavor beyond just bitter. And so the bitter kind of just gets tossed in the mix and it gets to go along for a ride with all those other yummy things so that you don't notice the bitterness first and foremost. So roasting your vegetables and all that takes is chopping them up into uniform size. Uniform size is really important because then they'll cook evenly. And then we all um, coat them in olive oil. That's also key is using an oil because oil allows the surface of the vegetables to get hot enough. Uh, water can only get to 212 degrees. Uh, oil can get much higher than that. And so when the oil gets to that higher temperature, that's when the caramelization happens on the outside of the vegetable. So oil is key, using a fat of some kind. And then salt um, is also important. So adding the the, the salt to enhance the flavor. So mixing those together, you can put pepper or other spices like we talked about earlier, and then um, putting that in the oven to roast. So that's the first one. And the second one is soup. Soup is a super easy one. It's perfect this time of year, eating a nice co cozy soup. Um, soup is another one where we can layer more flavors on top of the bitterness and help to uh, mask some of that flavor that people might um, be adverse to. Mm. mixing in other kinds of uh, sweet vegetables by also adding in things like acid um, or fats for richness. So you can use a little bit of cream. Um, you could use ghee. You could use from an acid perspective, a little bit of lemon juice or wine in order to balance out those flavors. And then again, the better bitterness will recede and some of those other flavors will come to the forefront. Lovely. I just had a really fun experiment um, today I was, I was telling you before we went live that we do our, we're part of a homeschool cooperative mm -hmm. and on Wednesdays we have six kids at our house and today we made um, rice pasta spirals and my partner David was like, will you make your like nutritional yeast cheesy sauce? And I was like, sure. And then I was like, let's use some cauliflower. Well, he got cauliflower out of the refrigerator and then we had some carrots that we had um, shredded that were left over from making sushi last night. Mm -hmm. like, let's steam those. So we steamed those and then blended them up with an immersion blender with some hot water and some olive oil and added a bunch of nutritional yeast and garlic and um, some soy sauce. And it made like a cheese sauce, but it was cauliflower and none of the kids knew. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. <laughs> and it was like a super creamy sauce. It was super, you know, you would have thought it was full of heavy cream, really. Um, but there was no dairy in it at all, not I even butter. That. Yeah. So 
I just had to share that little experience of hiding vegetables. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I have a lot of clients where they're like, can you help me? Like, because I don't want to eat my vegetables. <laughs> it's like, I think that phrase even has um, like a negative connotation, like eat your vegetables. Right. <laughs> Something you don't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I definitely work with a lot of people that are um, adjusting to having more vegetables in their diet. Yeah. yeah. And, and it is a big adjustment, but once it's there, it's, it's really solid. I feel like, cause it's harder to go back to eating more like processed foods mm -hmm. or, um, yeah, those flavors and textures are really, really yeah. powerful. It's very homogenous when you eat more of the processed foods in terms yeah. of the flavor and the textures that they go with. But with fresher foods, you get a much more of this wave of flavors that take you through a journey um, and texture as well that takes you all over the map. Yeah. Tell us about a experience or two where you had that like aha experience of like, texture or flavor where you're like, Ooh, this is exciting. Oh, like, do you yeah. have any? Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, one of the, the, for me was eating like really fresh seafood uh -huh. um, and the, that what had, what showed up when I had, um, I was, uh, we had just like fresh caught the fish and then steamed it right there. And so oh, wow. tasting the way that the food straight out of the ocean and it's like, it's so sweet and amazing. Um, and also I think the other one would be probably when I went to Italy and we had like the ingredients in Italy, they're very, very particular about what is sold in the market and they won't put things in the market if they are not of the right quality. And, you know, in the grocery store, we can, in the States, at least we can find things at the grocery store all time of year. They'll ship them from all over, but Italy is very much local. So if the farmer's not growing it, it's not going to be in the market that week. And so yeah. I had uh, tomatoes, like Italian tomatoes and the amount of flavor in that tomato is like, this is what tomatoes are supposed to taste wow. like. <laughs> and it was eye opening. That is definitely was a hobble when I was like, I get why people would like eat a tomato like a piece of fruit. It was so mm. delicious and amazing because of the freshness and the commitment to making sure that the quality of the item was there before putting it in the market and, and only serving it in the market when it was of that quality. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That sounds fun. <laughs> Um, talk to us a little bit about holidays coming up. Mm -hmm. What recommendations do you have for us in terms of having fun with food during the holidays, but also taking care of our health? Yeah, uh, I, I've been talking, I've been doing a series on Thanksgiving and prepping everyone for Thanksgiving. And so I just recently was talking about healthy dishes and, and finding the balance because I find it, this has happened at my house as well. The healthy dish kind of might get tucked around to the side of the table or it's kind of an afterthought and people don't really um, spend that much time on making sure that those dishes get the love that all the other heavy, rich foods get. <laughs> And so um, one thing that is really important to remember is that, that there should be balance in each dish that you put on the table. And so you taste it and you're like, oh, does it need a little more of this or a little more of that? But you also want to make sure there's balance across the entire table of all the dishes that you're serving. So anytime you have a feast like you do at Thanksgiving, you want to make sure that there's balance. And so we have very rich foods on the table. You might have like mashed potatoes with gravy and you have a turkey and so you have these really rich starchy or fatty foods that are on the table so you want to make sure we're balancing that out by also bringing foods that will have acid to them and that will have lightness and refreshing flavors to them because that gives the palate an opportunity for relief from those heavier foods and in your You'll notice this like we do um, lots of different dishes where you'll end it by just adding a little squeeze of lemon juice. And what that lemon juice is doing is just balancing everything out and it's giving the palate an opportunity to be relieved so it can then pick up all those other flavors again. So um, you, when you're making healthy dishes, for instance, you want to add a salad to the table, um, making sure that we season that salad. So the salad should get the same kind of love. We're adding salt to them and salt. It's not just about saltiness. It's about enhancing the flavors that are natural there. So adding a little salt will help to enhance the flavor of those leaves. And then making sure we are also bringing in 
uh, other rich flavors, like we can add fats and it doesn't have to just be through, you know, oil, but it could be through oils. It could be through nuts. It could be through uh, cheese. It could be all of these other things that also provide richness. And then we also bring the acid again. So that could be through the vinaigrette that we put on top. We could use vinegar. We could use lemon or lime juice. We could use a little bit of wine as well to bring some acid to the party. And then texture is really important when it comes to salad because we have these kind of limp leaves that are laying there. So we want to bring something in that will make them more exciting. So we can bring in um, a nuts again are a great one. The creaminess from cheese is another texture. We could add some fresh fruit or other um, fresh vegetables that we put in there. So like cucumbers and tomatoes, or it can be um, seasonal things right now. So like pears and apples are really great to add into a salad to bring in more texture and they also bring acid to the party because fruit um, also is a contributor for acid so mixing those things together will help to make their side dish not just you know something that sits at the back of the table but something that can be also be a star of the show and something that people really enjoy eating and going back to the roasted vegetables and soup those are also something that are are um, great to bring in for the holidays to your table as well so that you can bring in some um, some dishes that will provide that balance across the table of having platters, uh, having dishes that will um, be able to hit all the different parts of your palate and have uh, a feeling of satiation at the end of the meal. Awesome. What are some of your favorite vegetables to roast this time of year? Oh, I love squash. I've been having a love affair with delicata squash. This mm -hmm. I absolutely love it. The sweetness, my son, he, I have a one-year-old son. He absolutely loves it. Um, but any kind of squash, I just did pumpkin um, as well recently. Zucchini, all of the squash are really great. Um, I also like doing it a little bit with um, like sweet things like the app pears and, and apples. Roasting though is are really nice because you can add them. I, I'll add those into uh, dessert, but also into savory things like a salad or I'll mix them in with um, my eggs in the morning. Um, so that's another one I like to roast. Uh, what else? We do a lot of roasted cauliflower at my house. Um, another, basically it's kind of whatever my son has grown to love. So we uh -huh. like loves eggplant. He loves cauliflower, uh, beets, all of those things that he really enjoys are the things Things that we we make time and time again. Nice. <laughs> kind of the, the ruler of he's, what's on the menu. He's um, the taste tester. Yeah, he says, okay. "I'll take that, but yeah. not that." It's actually been great because he's so open, and I know some some kiddos are not yeah. vegetable fans, but he's actually been really open. So I feel very very fortunate that he'll eat all of those things. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I just want to add in too, from an Ayurvedic perspective, is that childhood is kapha life stage, which is um, earth and water. So it's the time of like that dense, it's dense sweetness. Mm -hmm. Like we need that in a way. It's not necessarily that we need lots of sugar and cream per se, but like think about mother's milk, right? Like breast milk is very um, rich and sweet. And those flavors are really needed for childhood, <clears throat> for us to feel grounded mm. and connected in our early years. And it's what a lot of us long for. It's our, the comfort food that mm. we seek later in life that we turn to, to be like, you know, I, I want to feel those, those connections or um, memories of when I was younger. Yeah. And so anyway, it's just interesting, you know, pretty much all kids are drawn to, you know, sweet things, fatty things, you know. Like yeah, he kids loves the avocado. Just, He'll eat avocados yeah. every day, all day long. I was like, okay, that's enough avocado. <laughs> yeah. And it's so good, you know, and we know that fats are really helpful for brain development and, you know, all those things. And yeah, we have a little friend of, of Juniper's that will just like eat a, a whole chunk of butter. Like she'll just be like, you know, <laughs> she's seven. She's just like, oh yes. You know, and, and I see that from an Ayurvedic perspective, I'm like, yeah, girl, go get it, you know, but like, you know, other people are like, oh my gosh, what is she doing? That's, you know, it's like, yeah, you need that, like really yeah. dense, nourishing, you know, um, so like root vegetables fall into that too, or like those dense winter squashes and the sweetness um, and the rooted earth quality of those foods. 
So anyway, that's just kind of fun. Well, I, to feel, I feel a very um, <laughs> like not like I'm doing it, doing it right. If he's eating all that stuff and you're yeah. saying that that's <laughs> on the right track. It's so good. It's so yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. And not to say that, you know, a little bit of broccoli or Brussels sprouts or whatever every once in a while isn't good to you. But yeah, that, that, that time of life is really about that, like earth, earth and water elements, um, nourishing those. So um, tell us, well, was there anything else you wanted to say about holiday foods? Um, no, I think that that kind of covers, covers it. Okay, cool. So um, I'm, I want you to tell us a little bit about where people can find you and also what, what you do, what you offer with yeah. food so people can take advantage of learning from you. Yeah. So um, what I do, I help food lovers and home cooks to bring infinite possibilities to their kitchens. And I offer virtual cooking lessons. And I do that both one on one as well as in groups. And I do team building events as well. So um, if you are interested in getting in touch with me, the best place to do that is right here on Facebook. Um, I have a group, it's called Travel and Feast. And there I do travel inspired um, cooking tips and recipes. And I do a show also every week. Um, Hannah was just there with me as my guest yesterday, which was amazing. Um, so you can find me um, there in Travel and Feast. And my company is also the Well Traveled Palette, and you can come to thewelltraveledpalette.com, and you can, um, if you'd like to talk to me more about cooking lessons or group events, you can uh, set up time to chat with me on there. Yay! Well, thank you so much, and um, yeah, it's really fun to watch Natasha's um, lives and be in her kitchen. She does cooking demos. Um, well, I know you just did a launch with lots of cooking demos. Um, I did, it was yes. amazing. <laughs> lots of lots of classes, and so tune in there. There's there's some great great things on her on her Facebook page, and that is travel and feast. Right? Yes, travel. And okay, and we'll post it again below. So, any any last words of wisdom? for oh, food lovers out there. I just say to enjoy cooking and to make cooking and eating really, really fun. And there's no wrong answers. That's the thing that I love is cooking is about experimenting and playing. And so make sure to, to play and have fun when you are cooking and eating. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> go, go have fun in your kitchen, everyone. Yeah, go, go have fun <laughs> and play and open up that spice cabinet and just start, you know, tossing stuff in <laughs> into the pot and see what happens. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Natasha. It's been thank lovely you. having you. It's such a pleasure. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thanks.